glad to be with you. It is indeed a wonderful thing to come together uh, with the brethren. Uh, so as it was, uh, as our minds were directed in our thoughts for this morning by the good reading, uh, we want to ask ourselves the question, what must I do? This rich, rich young ruler uh, that Rick had read about here, uh, he asked that same question, you know, what, what shall I do? And Jesus told him, you know, to keep the commandments. And he laid out the commandments. Now keep in mind, you know, that this is prior to the establishing of the Lord's church, keeping our, our, our mind thinking in the, uh, the proper time frame there. And you know, all of these things still uh, follow through. If we are to be those that name Christ, you know, we, we're not going to murder. We're not going to commit adultery. We're not going to steal. We're not going to give false testimony. And we're going to honor our father and mother and love our neighbor as ourself. And we're going to do those things because of Christ. Because these are the things that just, these are things that naturally uh, come to those that are seeking after the Lord. Now, this rich young ruler had a bit of a predicament, didn't he? He, he, uh, he, he was holding on a bit to his, his things, his earthly uh, things that he'd owned. And, you know, the long and the short of it here, what must I do? And, of course, when we come to the end of this lesson, we'll talk about what must I do to be saved. Uh, but in the, in the meantime, or after, or let's say after uh, we are obedient to the gospel of Christ, there are still things that we must do. We have to put God first. We have to make sure that there aren't things in our lives that are getting in the way of our walk with the Lord. Uh, that's, the, that's the long and the short of it. There, I've told you the lesson. It's all done. But we'll keep you for a few more minutes uh, and go over a few, a few thoughts. One of the things that we must do is that we must receive exhortation. If we go over to Acts 2, which is a, a very uh, popular uh, scripture for us, uh, we tend to talk about it quite a bit. And there's good reason for that, because this is where the Lord's church is established. This is where uh, the people came to understand what they must do in order to be saved. In Acts 2, we see uh, a group of Jews gathered together, and they're being told, uh, they're being told that this is the Christ that you have crucified. And they were cut to the heart. And in verse uh, 38, uh, when they, actually, let's go back to 37. Now when they heard this, that they had crucified both Lord and Christ, they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? In verse 38, then Peter said, Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Now, and as we, we think about what we've just read there, especially verses 41 and 42, we have those that have been exhorted, those that, those that have been built up by the word of God, those that have been taught by the word of God, and they then acted. They were willing to receive that exhortation. They were willing to listen and not only just hear the words that were coming out of, coming out of the mouth of the speaker, but also they were willing to act. They understood what they must do. They received that exhortation and, and then acted upon it. And I fear all too many times in, in our lives, we find ourselves unwilling to listen, unwilling to receive that exhortation, unwilling to take action in a place in our lives that, that may need to take place. You know, it, it is uh, oftentimes difficult. We run, into, we run into situations where we find ourselves caught with something that well, we really like, that we really love. 
Things that, things that uh, we are finding out as we study the scriptures are not pleasing in the eyes of the Lord. So we, we have a choice. We can receive that exhortation and uh, take it into account and make a, make a correction in our lives or we walk the other way. You know, it, it is just that simple. We have uh, been given this uh, free will. You know, from the very beginning, going back to the account of Adam and Eve in the garden, you know, there was that exhortation by, by God of this, of this tree you shall not eat. There, was, there were two choices. To listen and receive that exhortation and, and move on in a godly way or, or walk in the other direction. So as we walk through life, we, we have to ask ourselves again some, some things. This is a short list of what must I do, but as Christians, we have to receive that exhortation. As human beings, uh, in order to even get into uh, the Lord's church, even to uh, be able to, to take part in that and to grab hold of that salvation, we have to receive the exhortation of the scriptures. We have to have ears that are open, hearts that are open to hear that word. Another thing that we must do is to be steadfast. And again, as we look, we'll look here again in Acts 2, just a few verses further, we have to be steadfast. Let's read verse 42, picking up where we left off. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. These are the ones that were just baptized. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. They continued. They continued in doctrine. They didn't allow themselves to go back to the beliefs that they previously uh, had. They understood that this new doctrine, this doctrine that Christ uh, had given, that, that, that uh, was now being spoken, they understood that that was what they must be steadfast in. Now these were, were uh, those that were very religious these Jews that crucified Christ, uh, in, ma in many cases, believed they were doing the right thing uh, because they were being told by the leaders of their, of, their, uh, of their synagogues and so on, who should have known better, who should have known better because they had the scriptures. They had all of the opportunity to see that this is Christ, yet they missed it. But... Those that were, had good, honest hearts, those that gladly received, as we read a moment ago, they, they switched their, their focus and they became steadfast in this doctrine. They continued together in fellowship and that's more than just getting together and being friends. You know, having, having fellowship one with another is... You know, learning together is, is uh, helping one another through the difficulties of life. And as I often point out, you know, that's what we have here amongst this group of Christians that meets locally right here. We have a family. When one of us is in need, when one of us has a difficulty, uh, we know that we have the brethren that we can count on. And, and, and I can certainly speak for myself and say that my family and I are definitely... Uh, built up by you. My, uh, we, we are blessed to be a part of the number here. Uh, we also read that they continued in the breaking of bread. And when you look at that, uh, w w when we look at that word, uh, you know, this is, uh, I'm reading my note here. Uh, th this is the, this thing takes place on the first day of the week. This is the type of breaking of bread that we see that we're going to do here in just a few moments. This is not just a common meal. This is not just saying that they were coming together and eating a common meal, but that they continued in the fellowship, the doctrine, the fellowship, and the breaking of the bread, which is what is commanded on the first day of the week of the Lord's people. And they continued in prayers. You know, they were steadfast in these things that they were learning and that they were understanding but they were understanding in the teaching of the word. 
So when we look at what we must do as Christians, we must receive exhortation and we must be steadfast. If you're, again, outside of Christ, you receive the exhortation of the scriptures and then take action upon those things and then continue. You know, one of the things that we talk about and we'll talk about here at the end of the lesson is repentance and repentance is a turning away from sinful things. Repentance is not an I'm sorry. Repentance is a godly sorrow. It is something that creates, necessarily creates an action within us which causes us to walk towards Christ and away from the things that perhaps have held us back and separated us, certainly separated us from the Lord in the past. It's a change. Now there's, uh, I often bring it up, and, and I know uh, references to, to, to uh, popular Christian music can be dangerous because there's, so there's so much false teaching that goes on with those things. But one of the songs that I remember from my youth, uh, the words of it say, what about the change? And basically as the storyline of the song goes along, talking about you, you, you've, you're a Christian now. You've, 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 uh, uh, you're in Christ. And now, what about the change? What about the difference? What, what, what's different about you? Are you continuing in the same old ways? Are you doing the same old things? And that's a good message. That's, that's biblical. We can find that in the scriptures that we are to be new creatures. We are to be those that continue and that are steadfast in the doctrine of the Lord. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 and at verse 58. Again, speaking to the church at Corinth. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know, that's just, it cuts right to the, right to the base of, of what it means to have faith, to understand that the things that we do, you know, this thing that we do on the first day of the week, uh, so many might look at it as just another ritual that those guys are going through. There they are. You know, they're, they're showing up uh, on Sunday morning. You know, as, as our friends and our family uh, talk to us and uh, sometimes we'll they'll look at us and say, well, why do, you, why do you think you have to be there every Sunday morning? Why do you think, uh, well, why is it so important to you? Because we want to be those that are abounding in the work of the Lord. And there's more to it uh, than just showing up on Sunday morning. But we need to be those that, that do just that, that are steadfast. Steadfast in the things that, that we have here in the scriptures. Steadfast in again, understanding the direction that we must do. It takes work. It takes work to be steadfast in anything. We need to also be willing to train ourselves in godliness. And that doesn't mean that we, again, figure out what we think we should do. But to train ourselves in godliness means that we're going to read the scriptures, that we're going to understand what they say. You know, I, I've, I know I've mentioned before, some of you probably haven't heard it, uh, when I was in college, I had a professor that uh, gave us, it was a philosophy class, and he gave us the, uh, the, the challenge to write about good and evil, the nature of good and evil, but he gave us the limitation that we were not allowed to use the scriptures in order to do that. Well, I came up with the, with the idea that I was going to fail this class. And I wrote the paper anyway and said, I don't know how to talk about good and evil without the scriptures. Because that's where we come to know what good and evil is. You know, if we don't have the scriptures as that, guide, as that guidebook, as we can see in the world today, so many that don't, anything goes. Murder can be okay in the eyes of some because they don't have a... They don't have a compass to lead them in the direction of godliness. Which of us can on our own, out of our own, our own thoughts, come up with a way 
to be godly and be sure that we're right about that. We can't unless we are looking at the word of the Lord. We need to train ourselves in godliness. You know, in, in uh, the letter to Timothy, Timothy was told, let's, let's turn over to, to 1 Timothy. First Timothy 4 and at verse 7. Paul is writing to Timothy and he, you know, of course is, is directing these thoughts to him. But we can take, we can take some exhortation. We can take some uh, information from this passage and we can certainly apply it uh, to our lives. Even though we are not all of us in the same boat as Timothy, we're not going to be, uh, not all of us are going to be out there and be preachers. But these, nonetheless this still applies. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 7, it says, But reject profane and old wives' fables, and exercise yourself toward godliness. And if you have the, the New American Standard, I believe it says, train yourself in godliness. You know, we have to exercise ourselves or train ourselves towards godliness. If we skip ahead to verse 16, I mean, by all means, read the rest of the, of the verses, but for, for time right now, we'll skip ahead to verse 16. And it says, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. You know, this is, again, not just thinking about God and saying, I love Jesus, and then doing whatever we want. This is exercising ourselves. And exercise, we know what that means. We, we all hate it, probably, unless there are some of us in this room that enjoy something like running or, uh, or something like that. Uh, if we really think about it, that's hard work. And if we're going to exercise ourselves toward godliness, we're going to do the hard work of reading the scriptures. Receiving that exhortation from it, understanding that some of it's going to hurt. Some of it's going to change our lives. And as we uh, think about, uh, those of you that know me know that I don't like change. I've mentioned many times I don't like it when furniture moves around in my house. I don't like it when the color on the wall changes. I'm very happy just keeping things the way that they are. And I think that's the way most people are to some degree. But uh, we need to be those that are willing to make that change, to train ourselves in godliness and then and understand that with that training, we, we become better at it. We become better at it. I, I know that uh, uh, there are some in this room that uh, have served in the military and uh, you went to training and it was difficult. It took a lot of hard work. And in the end, it changed the way you did things. You were then prepared to move forward. And if we are going to claim the name of Christ, we have to train ourselves nonetheless that same way in godliness. We need to do the hard work. We need to be able to get better at doing this thing uh, in seeking Christ. Again, what must I do? We've been talking so far about receiving that exhortation and being steadfast and, and treat, uh, training yourself in godliness. And then we need to be those that take responsibility for our shortcomings. And this last point kind of connects with the first point in a way. And that's, that's kind of on purpose. We're kind of ending where we began. We need to be those that receive that exhortation. We need to be those that take responsibility for our shortcomings. When we receive that exhortation and we find out that we have, again, a shortcoming in our lives, something that is not in alignment with the Lord's will, then we need to take responsibility for that. You know, if you have, if you have children, you have no doubt heard about this person that may live in your house called nobody. When you ask your child, who, who, who did this? Who left the refrigerator door open? Who made this mess? And it's nobody. They'll say nobody did it. Or they'll point the finger to their brother and you go down the line and the sister and then you go down the line until you run out of children and you're left with perhaps the dog or the cat 
and they seem to be pretty innocent most of the time. But a lot of times we like to point fingers. We like to say, well, I didn't do that. And when we find a shortcoming within ourselves, we like to say, well, it's because, it's because I was raised this way. It's because of the things that I went through as a child. It's because of this or that. There's always some other, some other reason that we'd like to think about in our minds. But at some point, we just have to take responsibility. You know, we all learn this in some way, perhaps as we're growing up, uh, perhaps we have someone, uh, a, 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 an adult, an older person that teaches us this responsibility. I, I fear it's something that is disappearing from our culture today. And there's a lot of people in this world today, as there always have been, but at least from, from our perspective here, sometimes it, th- it seems like it's more uh, there are those that just won't take responsibility for their actions. Understanding that we need to first own that. And, and I've, I've said it before, and we make this analogy many times, that when you look at organizations such as uh, Alcoholics Anonymous and those, those groups that help people get rid of an addiction, the first thing that they point out is that you have to recognize that you have a problem. You have to own that thing. You have to say, yes, this is an issue and I need to fix it. Without taking that responsibility for shortcoming, you can't can't do away with that thing. You can't work on it. You can't can't help that to be worked out. We need to take responsibility for our shortcomings. If we turn, turn with me to Proverbs 28, Proverbs 28, verse 13. Going back to the Old Testament, books of wisdom, Proverbs 28, and then at verse 13, it says, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. If we d- just seek to cover up our sins and say, well, I, I didn't do that, or this was somebody else's fault, I didn't mean to do that. And we, and we just make ourselves feel better with the things that we, that we say and that we think. It's not going to prosper. We're not going to, we're not going to win this race. We're not going to come out as victors. But if we recognize and we confess that we have a problem, that we are sinners, and then we forsake those sins, we turn away from those things and we no longer seek after them, then the Lord gives us mercy. Now, it's, again, uh, we, don't, we don't find in the scriptures a works salvation. There are things that people do because they understand that Christ is. Because they know who he is and they know what he's asked people to do, they do it. But it's not that Not that any work that we can do can work out our own salvation. There's nothing that we can possibly do. For instance, oftentimes people will point to the baptism in in water and say, well, that's just a work. So you're telling me you you have to do this work in order to earn your salvation? Well, of course not. You know, it's again, this is the mercy of the Lord. This is his free gift to those that are obedient to him. And we're obedient to him not, be, not simply because of something that we're going to get in return, but because he is Christ, because he is Lord. We understand that properly when we, when we really take into account what it means that he is Christ. Again, we, we are obedient. You think back again uh, to those that were in the presence of the Lord. You think of Moses. You think of those that that were in the presence of the Lord, and, and, and what were they? They were, they were prostrate on the ground. They weren't, they weren't just going on with whatever they wanted to do. They, they, they stood up and took, took notice. They were reverent. When we take responsibility for our shortcomings, we do those things. We become those that are reverent. We become those who confess and understand, yes, I need the Lord. Let's go backwards one chapter to the book of Psalms. 
We'll go to Psalm number 32. You'll probably get there before I do because my fingers aren't cooperating here. Psalm number 32, the first five verses. Psalm 32, and the first five verses will kind of end our thoughts here today. Psalm 32 of verse 1, a psalm of David, a contemplation. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And this is coming from a man who very well, he understood how wonderful and glorious God could be. He was blessed many times over. He also was one who understood how difficult it was to keep your own thoughts, desires, and lusts in check. If you study David, you know, he had those issues just the same as we do. Uh, he came to understand and he came to uh, really appreciate the mercy of the Lord, the forgiveness of, of iniquity. Now, and as we look back uh, throughout history and, and what we have written here in the scriptures, we see many examples of those who, who come to that understanding. So today, as we end this, these thoughts, this lesson, uh, will you ask the question, what must I do? Will you, are you willing to do what the Lord has asked? You know, right now you're, you're hearing a bit of the word and I hope that your ears are open and I hope that you're allowing the word to do its work inside of your heart. I hope that you're willing to receive exhortation from the scriptures. I hope that you're willing then to become steadfast. And in that, we understand that when we gain that faith by hearing the word, as we read about in Romans 10, 17, when we gain that faith that we believe that he is, then it should just automatically, we're going to confess him. We're going to say, this is the Christ. I believe that he is. And we're going to want to walk in his path. We're going to change our direction. We're going to repent from sin and turn away from it and walk towards Christ. If you're willing to do that and be buried in the waters of baptism, because he said so, because it is, it is his command, then don't wait another day. If you find that the road has been difficult, you find that you've, you've been dragged down by, again, a sin that you've allowed in your life, again, take responsibility for that shortcoming. Take responsibility for it and say, I need Christ. I understand and ask for the prayers of the saints that you might be restored to faithfulness. Whatever your need, if you need to put on Christ and baptism here today, if you need to ask for the prayers of the saints, calling upon that second law of pardon from 1 John 1 at verse 9, then by all means come forward as we stand and sing.